Hi, I'm Andrew Martin. I'm the group publisher at cybersecurityasean.com and today I'm going to be spending some time with uh, Supna from Trend Micro and we're going to be discussing about security issues and trends in the BFSI industry. Um, but before we get into the conversation, Supna, great to have you with us today. Can you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and introduce yourself? Hello everyone, this is Sapna here. I'm the director for BFSI, Banking Financial Services and Insurance Business here in Ten Micro. I manage the entire Southeast Asia and I'm primarily based out of Singapore. Yeah, thanks Sapna. Um, before we get into maybe some of the specifics about security challenges, maybe you could share with us some of the trends that you're seeing across the BFSI sector right now. Hmm. Um, uh, BFSI, uh, as uh, the full form stands for Banking, Financial Services and Insurance, is a huge uh, vertical itself and um, every part of it has its strengths. But by and large, uh, let me pick up with banking to go with. Um, globally, as well as in Southeast Asia, we see there's a large push for uh, digital banking and neo banking. So um, Singapore is leading that uh, chart and we already have two uh, digital banks which are operational here and uh, close enough is Malaysia and then now you have Thailand which is uh, already um, on the path of releasing three virtual banking licenses by the year 2025. So um, more and more traditional banks are also um, kind of uh, venturing out to the venues how they can reach out to the new generations of Gen Z's and Alphas using their digital native platforms. That's on the on the banking side. But otherwise, there is a greater push from the government as well across Southeast Asia um, uh, for financial inclusion, which means that um, finance available to the last mile of the country, to the poorest of the poor, is a very strong theme. And hence, we see a rise of fintechs across Southeast Asia. So be it uh, Singapore, where um, I think last year there were close to around 501 fintech companies, or in Philippines, which has close to around 256 fintechs. So th there is a boom and a rise of fintechs to kind of, um, uh, which is which is aligned with the policies of every country for financial inclusion. And then, um, you know, while ChatGPT is making a great buzz, you have generative AI, immersive AI, which is um, getting hugely adopted by the banks and it's going to be the mainstay. So whether it is robo-advisors, it is about loan and KYCs, all of these uh, services which are essential for the bank to function are going to be uh, led by AI and AI related technologies. And then on the regulation side, we see soup tech, reg tech, a great push from all the reg regulators across the board. Whether it is the sandboxing scheme here in uh, Singapore or the Asterisk platform that was announced earlier this year by BSP in Philippines is all an endeavor towards making regular uh, regulations and compliances adherences by the BFSIs in a more real time manner so that the time to the market ease of doing business uh, all of that uh, is much easier and faster. So these are uh, some of the trends uh, and of course on the user side I would say that the uh, Southeast Asia has a flourishing digital payment landscape. Uh, on all the countries that's what we have observed across the board, uh, more and more transactions are becoming uh, paperless transactions, digital transactions and of course COVID was a big driver to it but the users are now um, getting more savvier on using the digital payment uh, method as against the traditional ones. Yeah, very interesting and so many things and trends that you're highlighting that uh, uh, companies in this space have really got to think about. Um, regulation is one that I know is really important and uh, regulation itself uh, it has an impact on cybersecurity as well. Um, and on that, I'm actually just wondering, you know, what your views are um, in terms of how that cyber threat in the BFSI space is going to evolve in the coming years and what should organisations be doing to keep themselves prepared for what's coming? Hmm. I think the biggest um, a path of, uh, for cybersecurity for organisations is to kind of progress from maturity-based uh, programmes to more risk-oriented and risk-based approach approach towards cybersecurity. But that being said, there are compelling reasons that why organizations need to do that. 
So let me give certain facts and figures from last year. So um, and that's going to be pertinent for uh, this year and coming years as well. The first and foremost, the concern area is on the geopolitical tensions, right? There's an onslaught, ongoing war happening in one part of the world. And what that has resulted in while on the field and the ground, it looks like only two countries involved. There's a tremendous, tremendous amount of upsurge in the hacktivists. Now, the hacktivists are is, is, a, is a group, can be a person, can be a personnel, which may not be state sponsored, but have a clear agenda of forwarding a social and political mindset. And in order to do so, they are constantly on lookout for unauthorized access of critical systems. So last year, as well as this year, there has been a huge surge in um, in the activities we have observed from hacktivists. The second area would be um, the ransomware. So ransomware actually has changed a little bit of its shape and form. It has taken the shape of ransomware as a service. Now, um, it becomes extremely difficult for law enforcement agencies or organizations to always keep up to the speed of this new modus operandi because it works in a very interesting format. Ransomware as a service is like literally offering the entire ransomware package uh, as a service. Like uh, you, you don't need to have extremely technically sophisticated skill sets to, um, you know, launch an attack on the target. It all requires that anyone out there which has a motive of um, you know, uh, doing an extortion, uh, which uh, you just buy the package or just subscribe as a monthly service to these ransom as a service providers and pretty much get started. And the interesting fact is that the mode itself is getting different than the traditional ransomware attacks would be launched. So here, living of the land tools are actually exploited. For example, Copal Strike, which is mostly a tool used for penetration testing, uh, has been compromised uh, and it has come up on uh, our Trend Micro report as well as the first mode of entry. So we'll see that ransomware as a service is, 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 is gaining momentum um, and with that is the ways of extortion as well. So initially, um, there was a single extortion attempt, which was just encrypting the user's machine or critical data. And then we interesting had a uh, dual or double extortion, which was date associated with data exploitation. Now in last year and this year itself, half of the year, we've seen that the modus has changed from single extortion to double to triple and also few instances of uh, quadruple. And um, of course, banking uh, sector in specific is 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 a great uh, a lucrative field for the ransomware as a service. Um, you know, uh, the whole process to um, uh, thrive. So that's that's something we have seen. Apart from that, um, the other two um, you know common scenarios have been observed is the attempt to gain unauthorized access through the third parties and the supply chains. You know, more uh, whether it, it started for with Log4j and then we have Move It and other uh, such campaigns which uh, are, um, which, which we see is again rampant in the BFSI. So organizations need to kind of um, reinvent and revamp how they look at the security. And um, for that matter of fact, zero trust as an architecture, as an in, um, as as a more adva advanced level of looking at cybersecurity programs is is finding a, a momentum finally. So you have organizations uh, as well as the government uh, agencies which are uh, pushing for the zero trust adherences uh, or the policies to be op uh, adopted right at the uh, enterprise level. Um, so these are a few of the trends which are uh, being observed, which is an outcome of the uh, a massive attack surface expansion, which has happened in the last couple of years. And organizations are largely going to focus uh, towards that. Yeah. Thanks, Sapna. I think, um, you know, when you point out just, uh, you know, like with things like ransomware as a service, just how easy it is for those uh, bad actors to be able to start to uh, getting into their business of trying to breach and compromise BFSIs, it's, uh, it's kind of a scary thought. Um, and I guess that, you know, you, you mentioned about zero trust. Um, 
and how that's going to be the way forward uh, uh, kind of imperative. But I'm just wondering, as people do adopt zero trust, do they also have to think about some of the regulatory and compliance issues that they need to build into that approach? And, and if so, what are some of the specific regulations and compliance issues that uh, BFSI in Southeast Asia need to think about? So from a regulatory space, uh, I would say in Southeast Asia, the regulators across um, uh, the board are, uh, uh, are quite, quite forward looking in terms of um, time and again, revising, adopting to the new uh, tech norms that are getting adopted by the business. So the example I would cite is by uh, the recent update which has happened in the um, Malaysia uh, guidelines, which goes by the name of RMIT issued by Bank of Nigara Malaysia, which was um, primarily released or updated with a sense to incorporate the cloud security uh, usage by the banking sector and the financial sector in large. So um, this is the first time uh, that BNM has made it very clear in terms of uh, what the organizations need to bring in for containing their risk on, on cloud. And the guidelines goes exhaustive in terms of uh, uh, the, the doing the cloud risk assessments before porting the critical applications and taking very cautious approach uh, which i would say that it's a it's a great forward looking step because it is not about stopping uh, the uh, financial sector from getting the advantage of moving to cloud but taking a more calculated and a risk based approach to uh, port over the cloud so i would say that is one of the areas that uh, uh, the regulators across the board are doing well, um, whether now it is in Malaysia or earlier was Singapore uh, or BSPs in bits and piece has also kind of had some guidelines and very, very, very soon um, OJK is going to release a formal documentation on the cloud usage as well. So that being said, uh, the cloud adoption uh, is one part and the other area of thrust uh, which is on top of everybody's mind is the usage of generative AI. In fact, uh, across um, there are a lot of non-profit organizations which are working towards understanding what are the privacy um, uh, and compliance uh, implications of using the generative AI in its uh, as is form. So I personally believe that generative AI made it to uh, users much faster than it was anticipated. So the users are using it without knowing what are going to be the privacy and compliance uh, implications to it. And uh, this is something that the organizations uh, cannot uh, do alone. That's something that regulators are kind of uh, putting a lot of uh, effort in understanding the overall uh, implications. And I'm hopeful that very soon there will be certain guidelines. But as a custodian on the technology side, all I can say is that um, it is imperative for the technology vendors uh, like Trend Micro to kind of stay abreast towards adoption of this uh, technology as well as helping the customers to be aware of the usage of this technology. So to give you an example that Trend Micro this month itself actually released um, uh, um, uh, the usage of a chatbot on our XDR platform um, that goes with the name of Companion and the objective is using the generative AI effectively to reduce the alert fatigue or the burden on uh, the SOC analyst as well as the future state um, as, as, as I see is to also give in more visibility on the usage of um, you know, whitelisted generative AI applications. So um, I think um, we we as a technology providers are uh, you making use of generative AI more for the benefit of the end users at the moment. But at the same time, we are working towards seeing that how it can help the organizations to keep a tighter uh, visibility on, on the usage side um, for the compliance perspective, yeah. It's, it's actually really good to hear that, uh, in your view, the regulators are uh, evolving their compliance and regulation guidelines at a pace that enables the, the banks and the FSIs to uh, keep pace with the digital transformation they've got to make. Um, and in that respect, I'm wondering, 
how are you and Trend actually helping businesses? So what are some of the features and new capabilities that Trend are bringing to actually help uh, companies in Southeast Asia and the BFSI space uh, to deal with the uh, cybersecurity threat challenge that they have? Okay, so Trend Micro is observing the global trends in the BFSI vertical um, uh, itself, as I said in the beginning of this interview, that we are following some of the key uh, global trends, be it digital banking, be it reg tech, soup tech, um, or digital native uh, banking offerings, which are going to be the mainstay. So Trend Micro has its uh, solutions and offerings tailored that will help the organizations to kind of quickly adopt to these trends. Let's take an example of uh, digital native banks. Now, digital native banks are the banks which pretty much work like fintechs, uh, born in cloud, operate out of cloud. And for that to do, to do their business with confidence, they require a lot of um, um, guardians, um, a guidance on rather on the cloud side. So Trend Micro's Cloud One uh, offering, which is a platform uh, which um, uh, allows the uh, end customers to safeguard their workloads, to containers, to do the policy governance, and also to do to do a quick check on the environment whether they are running as per the well architected framework or not. So it just uh, reduces the time to the market because in a way we are actually pushing ourselves into the entire dev uh, DevOps life cycle, which helps in kind of releasing the product or cutting down the time to the market for the organizations. Now, in addition to it, I would re-emphasize by saying, for example, uh, the, the fact that um, with an expanding attack surface expansion, uh, because of the fact the organizations are now in, in, a, in a very I would say in a very different situation, they have resources on prem, they have resources on cloud and third party supply chain, which are either they are serving or getting service from. So it requires a comprehensive, a consolidated visibility on the attack surface, as well as have a faster detection and response. So the XDR platform that Trend Micro has, it is almost fitting into a master SOC uh, uh, theme, whereby we are picking up the telemetry from the um, user side, from the critical assets, which could be servers on-prem still, as well as cloud, then network email, and also allows um, the organization's ecosystem components to kind of get onboarded onto uh, the RxDR platform to give a very unified and a centralized visibility as well as uh, response and remediation benefit back to the clients. Uh, what tops on top of what I said is that there is a robust uh, threat research which goes on uh, finding the active um, threats which are lurking on a specific vertical and pumping it back as a threat intel onto our XDR platform so that the customer is well prepared in advance what are the possible threats they, they could face um, as, a, as a part of this vertical. So um, in all, uh, an understanding of the uh, massive attack surface, managing it, um, notifying the boards in terms of the language they would um, uh, easily identify in terms of the risk scores and also pass on the benefit back to the clients in terms of having a deeper um, response and remediation. We are the zero trust. Um, uh, you know, um, zero trust architecture support that happens on top of our XDR engine itself. Yeah. Yeah, there really was a lot to unpack there. There are such a lot of areas that you covered, but one thing that really resonated with me was the fact that it's not just about the security, it's the fact that the security you choose is going to be instrumental in how fast you can actually bring new offerings and digital native offerings to market. Um, it hadn't really occurred to me that, that security is a big part of uh, that, you know, how you can accelerate that process and that's very, very interesting. Um, Sapna, thanks so much for your time today. It has been fascinating uh, and I think it's really interesting to see how companies like Trend um, go beyond just providing generic solutions and have subject matter area, uh, subject matter experts such as Sapna 
that work in particular verticals like BFSI so that they can really tailor the offerings uh, to the particular needs of that industry and that vertical. Uh, very valuable. Uh, once again, thank you so much for your time.